Uh, we left off on the 26th juz or the 26th section. And uh, there is a protocol to take when you're approaching the Quran. And the first thing that you do is you grab ablution, which is wudu. If you need instructions on how to do that, there's plenty of videos out there on how to do that. Next thing, what you do is you set your intention straight and uh, purify your thoughts as you approach the Quran to seek knowledge from uh, the most merciful, the almighty God. That way that he can give you an opening in your heart and your uh, mind to understand and inculcate what's being said. And then uh, lastly, you seek refuge from the accursed shaitan by saying, Once again, to preface, I'm not a scholar, so these are not opinions on the Quran, rather just my own personal reflections. But side by side with me, I do have uh, Tafsir al and uh, he's going to give us some additional information into the insights of uh, the readings. All right, beautiful. We're on the tail end of Surah al Jafia. So uh, we only have just a few verses here before we conclude uh, and jump right into the very next chapter. So without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, jump right in. Bismillah rahman rahim And the evil consequences of what they did will appear to them and they will be enveloped by what they used to ridicule. And it will be said, today we will forget you as you forgot the meaning of this day of yours and your refuge is the fire. And for you, there are no helpers. That is because you took the verses of Allah in ridicule and worldly life deluded you. So that day, they will not be removed from it, nor will they be asked to appease Allah. Then to Allah belongs all praise, Lord of the heavens and Lord of the earth, Lord of the worlds. And to him belongs all grandeur within the heavens and the earth, and he is the exalted in might, the wise. And just, again, there's a, uh, a kind of a cyclical nature in the chapters, right? It's always um, systems of reward, punishment, then it's followed by uh, stories in between where you can extract wisdom, extract knowledge, give reference. Um, there's analogies. There's all sorts of ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us. And, you know, what a terrible, terrible form of existence it would be if uh, you're forgotten by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not in a sense that he's going to, uh, you know, forget you like you and I would forget our keys somewhere, but rather because you meaning a disbelieving person, openly rejected, ridiculed, followed the path of disbelief, and were perpetually in a state of uh, forgetfulness of where they're going, right? Because Islam answers the three key questions. Where did I come from? What am I doing here? And where am I going? Then naturally, the consequence of that is going to be a punishment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just casts you aside. And he says it's because the worldly life uh, caused you to become diluted, uh, right? So you were... You are in this state of delusion, thinking you're going to live forever. Modern medicine is going to push the boundaries and so on and so forth. And if you really look at what modern medicine does today, it's a quest for immortality, really. I mean, life is being prolonged, but the actual standard of living is just massively decreasing, right? Okay, perfect. So let's just jump right on into the next chapter. Uh, this is Surat Al-Aqqaf. And here we go. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It starts off by saying Hamim. The revelation of the book is from uh, the revelation of the book is from Allah, the Exalted in Might, the Wise. We did not create the heavens and earth and what is between them, except in truth and for a specified term. But those who disbelieve from that of which they are warned are turning away. So notice the warning is coming, but people are actively turning away, meaning. They're about facing, heading the wrong direction, or at least heading the direction in which they are not supposed to be heading, uh, and it is by choice. Say, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, have you considered that which you invoke besides Allah? Show me what they have created of the earth, or did they have partnership in creation of the heavens? Bring me a scripture revealed before this or remaining trace of knowledge if you should be truthful. So that's the challenge, right? Especially for those people that are saying that they're incredibly spiritual and that they have uh, their own way, their own path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala poses a question to them. What do you know of the unseen? And bring me the proof. And who is more astray than he who invokes besides Allah? Those will not res uh, those who will not respond to him until the day of resurrection, i.e. never. 
and they of their invocation are unaware. Meaning these things, these idols uh, that are being invoked, they have no intelligence to them, nor do they even have any form of existence whatsoever. And when the people are gathered that day, they who were invoked will be enemies to them and they will be deniers of their worship. And when our verses are recited to them as clear evidences, those who disbelieve say of the truth when it comes to them, this is obvious magic, meaning they're just pawning it off. Or do they say he has invented it? Say, if I have invented it, you will not possess for me the power of protection from Allah at all. He is most knowing of that in which you are involved. Sufficient is he as a witness between me and you, and he is the forgiving and the merciful. And notice this challenge is really grand in a sense that if the Prophet ﷺ, for whatever reason, was a liar, especially if he was lying about God, he would have been seized by God, right? right away say i am not something uh, i am not something original among the messengers nor do i know what will be done with me or with you i only follow that which is revealed to me and i am not but a clear warner and again we believe that all the prophets and the messengers were muslim say have you considered if it i.e the quran was from allah and you disbelieved in it while a witness from the children of Israel has testified to something similar and believed while you were arrogant, indeed Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. And those who disbelieve say of those who believe, if it had truly been good, they would not have preceded us to it. And when they are not guided by it, they will say, this is an ancient falsehood. And before it was the scripture of Moses to lead and as a mercy. And this is a confirming book in an Arabic tongue to warn those who have wronged and as good tidings to the doers of good. Indeed, those who have said our Lord is Allah and then remained on the right course, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. So again, part of the examination is you have to uh, testify, right, to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the messengerhood of his prophet, alayhi but then you have to remain on the right course. You can't just kind of do whiff waff stuff around and um, you know pretend like everything is all good, right? No, the examination continues, right? Those are the companions of paradise abiding eternally therein as a reward for what they used to do. And we have enjoined upon man to his parents good treatment. His mother carried him with hardship and gave birth to him with hardship, and his gestation and weaning period is 30 months. He grows until when he reaches maturity and reaches the age of 40 years. He says, my Lord, enable me to be grateful for your favor, which you have bestowed upon me and upon my parents, and to work righteousness of which you will approve and make righteous for me my offspring. Indeed, I have repented to you, and indeed, I am of the Muslims." So let's see if we can gain uh, a little bit of insight in regards to this um, weaning period and see if there's some additional useful information from the tafsir. So let me just get on over to verse 15. And uh, here we go. Because of his kindness towards his slaves and his appreciation towards parents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoins and instructs children to treat their parents kindly by speaking to them gently and nicely, spending on them and other ways of showing kindness. Then he points out the reason for that by mentioning uh, what the mother has to go through of hardship because of her child, such as hardship during pregnancy, then the hardship of birth, which is very painful, then the hardship of breastfeeding and looking after the child at that time. The things mentioned do not last for a short time, one or two hours. Rather, they go on for a long time, 30 months. Pregnancy lasts nine months or so, and the remainder of that time is for breastfeeding. This refers to what is usually the case. This verse, along with the other verse, mothers may breastfeed their children for two whole years. And that's in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, which is chapter 2, verse 233. is quoted as evidence that the minimum length of pregnancy is six months because uh, if the period of breastfeeding which is two years, is subtracted from 30 months. What is left is six months for pregnancy. Then when he reaches his prime, that is the pinnacle of his youth and intellect and reaches the age of 40 years, he says, oh my Lord, inspire me 
That is, guide me and help me to be constantly grateful for your blessings that you have bestowed upon me and my parents. That is spiritual blessings and worldly blessings. Gratitude means using those blessings in obedience to the one who bestowed them and granted them and responding to his blessings by acknowledging and admitting one's inability to give proper thanks and striving to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. A blessing to the parents is a blessing to their children and descendants because they will inevitably get some of them and uh, some of them and some of their effects, especially the blessings of religious commitment. Because the righteousness of the parent that is based on knowledge and deeds is one of the main reasons for the righteousness of their children. And do righteous deeds with which you will be pleased by helping me to do the type of deed that meets all the prerequisites of, of being sound and right and is free of anything that may spoil it. Such is the deed that Allah is pleased with, the, with and accepts and for which he gives reward and establish righteousness amongst my offspring for me. As he prayed for himself to be righteous, he also prays for his offspring to be righteous, asking Allah to rectify their condition. He stated that the benefit of the children's righteousness comes back to their parents because he said, and establish righteousness amongst my offspring for me. Verily, I repent to you from sins and acts of disobedience, and I come back to obedience to you. And verily, I am one of those who submit to Allah in Islam. Such, that is, those who are described here are the ones from whom we will accept their righteous deeds, which are acts of obedience because they also do other kinds of deeds and overlook their bad deeds in general terms. They will be among the inhabitants of paradise, so they will attain goodness and what they seek and evil and what they dislike will be removed from them. A true promise that has been given to them, that is, this promise that we have made to them is a true promise from the one who is the truest in speech, who does not break his promise. And what a beautiful explanation, especially because it's so comprehensive, starting with the parents and coming right back full circle back to the parents, because as the kids get old, the parents are also going to get old. And if you prayed for your offspring to be righteous and they're following the creed of Islam, they're following the way of life of Islam, then naturally they're going to be righteous towards their parents, which is in fact you. So when your parents reach old age, if you're treating them kindly and paying respect to them uh, and making sure that they're not alone, then full swing, uh, if you were to ask for that prayer and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to accept it, given these conditions being met, then your kids are going to take care of you in your old age. And what better uh, of a blessing could that be rather than being stuck in some senior home, not having any kids, not having any relatives, and so on and so forth. Um, so in a time where you're like extremely vulnerable, basically to the, to the same capacity that you are vulnerable as a child, uh, now you're in your way elderlyhood or your memory is gone, your strength is gone, everything is gone, right? And it's not a good time to be alone. Uh, during that time. So, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us good, righteous children uh, and make their offspring good and continue on down that chain so that we all follow the deen of Islam, inshallah. Uh, carrying on, those are the ones from whom we will accept the best of what they did and overlook their misdeeds, their being among the companions of paradise. That is the promise true, which they had been uh, promised. But one who says to his parents, uff to you, do not promise me that I will be brought forth from the earth when generations before me have already passed on into oblivion. While they call to Allah for help and to their son, woe to you, believe. Indeed, the promise of Allah is true, but he says this is not but the legends of the former peoples. So now this is a very, very interesting situation, especially because it's talking about having believing parents and they're making go out for their kid, but they're also pushing their child um, uh, forward into belief in a sense that they're trying to do what's best for him. And, um, you know, what a, what a terrible position to be in. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us so that our children don't go astray. Those are the ones upon whom the word, i.e. decree, has come into effect, who will be among the nations which had passed on before them of jinn and men. Indeed, they all were losers. And for all, there are degrees of reward and punishment for what they have done. And it is so that he may fully compensate them for their deeds and they will not be wronged. And the day those who disbelieve are exposed to the fire, it will be said, you exhausted your pleasures during your worldly life and enjoyed them. 
So this day you will be rewarded with the punishment of extreme humiliation because you were arrogant upon the earth without right and because you were defiantly disobedient. Carrying on. And mention, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the brother of Ad, when he warned his people in the region of Al-Aqaf, and warners had already passed on before him and after him, saying, Do not worship except Allah. Indeed, I fear for you the punishment of a terrible day. They said, Have you come to delude us away from our gods? Then bring us what you promised us if you should be of the truthful. He said, knowledge of its time is only with Allah, and I convey to you that with which I was sent, but I see you to be a people behaving ignorantly. And when they saw it as a cloud approaching their valley, they said, this is a cloud bringing us rain. Rather, it is that for which you were impatient, a wind within it, a painful punishment, destroying everything by command of its Lord, and they became so that nothing was seen of them except their dwellings. Thus do we recompense the criminal people. Um, let's see if the Tefsir gives us uh, a little bit more context, even though that it seems very, very self-explanatory. Uh, I want to see if um, it can give us a little bit more detail about the uh, cloud itself. Okay. Hence, uh, he says, so Allah sent against them the severe punishment, namely the wind that destroyed them utterly. Hence, he says, when they saw it, the, uh, which is the punishment, as a cloud approaching their valleys, that is, uh, it appeared like a cloud that came towards their valley that would provide water with which they would irrigate their lands and drink from their wells and streams. They said optimistically, this is a cloud bringing us rain. That is, this cloud will give us rain. Hud said, nay, rather it is that which you sought to hasten. That is, this is what you have brought upon yourselves when you said, bring us that with which you are threatening us if you're telling the truth. A wind bearing a painful punishment, it will destroy everything that it passes over because of its intensity and destructive power. Allah sent it against them for seven nights and eight days in succession so that you would have seen the people lying lifeless as if they were trunks of fallen palm trees. And that's in Surah Al-Haq, uh, which is uh, 69 verse 7. We haven't gotten there yet. By the command of its Lord, that is by his leave and his will. And they became such that there was nothing left to be seen except their empty dwellings, that is their flock, their wealth, and they themselves were destroyed. Thus we requit the evildoers because of their sin and wrongdoing. Although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had bestowed great blessing upon them, they did not give thanks to him or remember him. Hence, he says, we gave them power and prosperity to an extent to which we did not give it to you, O Quraysh. That is, we have given them power and prosperity in the land, so they were helping themselves to its good things and enjoying its pleasure. We made their lives long enough for anyone who might reflect and pay heed to do so. And for anyone who might be guided to follow guidance, in other words, we gave Ad power and prosperity more than we have given to you, O Quraysh. So do not think that what we have bestowed upon you has never been given to anyone else or that it will protect you from the punishment of Allah. Rather, others were given more power and prosperity than you, but their wealth, sons, and troops did not avail them from Allah in the slightest. Beautiful explanation by Sadi. Uh, carrying on. <clears throat> and we had certainly established them in such as we have not established you, and we have made for them hearing and vision and hearts, i.e. intellect. But their hearing and vision and hearts availed them not from anything of the punishment, when they were continually rejecting the signs of Allah, and they were enveloped by what they used to ridicule. And we have already destroyed what surrounds you of those cities, and we have diversified the signs or verses that perhaps they might return from disbelief. So again, we see this constant pushing towards belief uh, via reminder and via um, a display, right? Then why did those who took besides Allah as deities by which to approach him not aid them, but they had strayed, i.e. departed from them, and that was their falsehood and what they were inventing. 
carrying on. And mention, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we directed to you a few of the jinn listening to the Qur'an, and when they attended it, they said, listen attentively. And when it was concluded, they went back to their people as warners. They said, O oh, our people, indeed we have heard a recited book revealed after Moses confirming what was before it, which guides to the true and to a straight path. And, uh, o oh, our people, respond to the caller, i.e. messenger of Allah, and believe in him. He, i.e. Allah, will forgive for you your sins and protect you from a painful punishment. But he who does not respond to the caller of Allah will not cause failure to him upon earth. and He will not have besides him any protectors. Those are in manifest error. And now, interestingly enough, part of the challenge of the Quran is if you can produce something like it, then go ahead. Meaning that you have to impact both worlds, right? It's not just about the world of men. But whatever it is that you produce, uh, the, uh, the unseen world, the world of jinn has to witness it as well, and it has to impact them as well, right? Um, which, again, it's an impossible challenge. And that's why the Quran is, is uh, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because only the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can impact both worlds, and only the messenger, alayhi salam, that was sent for all of creation is going to uh, relay the message properly in a way that it will impact the unseen world, such as the jinn. Okay. Uh, do they not see that Allah who created the heavens and the earth and did not fail in their creation is able to give life to the dead? Yes, indeed, he is over all things competent. And the day those who disbelieved are exposed to the fire, it will be said, is this not the truth? They will say, yes, by our Lord. He will say, and taste the punishment for what you used to deny. So be patient, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as were those of determination amongst the messengers, and do not be impatient for them. It will be on the day they see that which they are promised, as though they had not remained in the world except an hour of a day. This is notification, and will any be destroyed except the defiantly disobedient people? So here we have a categorization of who's actually going to be destroyed, right? Wonderful, that concludes that surah. Next up, we have Surah Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Those who disbelieve and avert people from the way of Allah, he will waste their deeds. And those who believe and do righteous deeds and believe in what has been sent down upon Muhammad, and it is the truth from their Lord, he will remove from them their misdeeds and amend their condition. That is because those who disbelieve follow falsehood, and those who believe follow the truth from their Lord. Thus does Allah present to the people their comparisons. So when you meet those who disbelieve in battle, strike their necks until when you have inflicted slaughter upon them, then secure their bonds and either confer favor afterwards or ransom them until the war lays down its burdens. That is the command, and if Allah had willed, he could have taken vengeance upon them himself, but he ordered armed struggle to test some of you by means of others. And those who are killed in the cause of Allah, never will he waste their deeds. He will guide them and amend their condition and admit them to paradise, which he has made known to them. O oh, you who have believed, if you support Allah, he will support you and plant firmly your feet. But those who disbelieve, for them is misery, and he will waste their deeds. That is because they dislike what Allah revealed, so he rendered worthless their deeds. Have they not traveled through the land and seen how was the end of those before them? Allah destroyed everything over them. And for the disbelievers is something comparable. That is because Allah is the protector of those who have believed and... Uh, because the disbelievers have no protector. Indeed, Allah will admit those who have believed and done righteous deeds to gardens beneath which rivers flow. But those who disbelieved enjoy themselves and eat as grazing livestock eat, and the fire will be residence for them. And how many a city was stronger than your city, i.e. Mecca, which drove you out? We destroyed them, and there was no helper for them. 
So is he who is on clear evidence from his Lord, like him to whom the evil of his work has been made attractive and they follow their own desires? Is the description of paradise which the righteous are promised, wherein are rivers of water unaltered, rivers of milk, the taste of which never changes, rivers of wine delicious to those who drink, and rivers of purified honey, in which they will have from all kinds of fruits and forgiveness from their Lord, are its inhabitants like those who abide eternally in the hellfire and are given to drink scalding water that will sever their intestines? And among them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa are those who listen to you until when they depart from you, they say to those who were given knowledge, what, what has he said just now? Those are the ones of whom Allah has sealed over their hearts and who have followed their own desires. And those who are guided, he increases them in guidance and gives them their righteousness. And do they await except th that the hour should come upon them unexpectedly? But already uh, there have come some of its indications. Then how i.e. what good to them when it has come will be their remembrance. So know, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that there is no deity except Allah and ask forgiveness for your sin and for the believing men and believing women. And Allah knows of your movement and your resting place. Those who believe say, why has a surah not been sent down but when a precise surah is revealed and the battle is mentioned therein you see those in whose hearts is disease i.e hypocrisy looking at you with a look of one overcome by death and more appropriate for them would have been obedience and good words and when the matter of fighting was determined if they had been true to allah it would have been better for them <coughs> So would you perhaps, if you turned away, cause corruption on earth and sever your ties of relationship? Those who do so are the ones that Allah has cursed. So he deafened them and blinded their vision. Then do they not reflect upon the Quran or are there locks upon their hearts? Indeed, those who reverted back to disbelief after guidance had become clear to them, Satan enticed them and prolonged hope for them. That is because they say to those who disliked what Allah sent down, we will obey you in part of the matter, and Allah knows what they conceal. Then how will it be when the angels take them in death, striking their faces and their backs? That is because they followed what angered Allah and disliked what earns his pleasure. So he rendered worthless their deeds. Or do those in whose hearts is disease think that Allah would never expose their feelings of hatred? And if we willed, we could show them to you, and you would know them by their marks. But you will surely know them by the tone of their speech, and Allah knows your deeds. A very interesting choice that was used here in regards to the tone of their speech. And we will surely test you until we make evident those who strive among you for the cause of Allah and the patient, and we will test your affairs. Indeed, those who disbelieved and avert, averted people from the path of Allah and opposed the messenger after guidance had become clear to them. Never will they harm Allah at all, and he will render worthless their deeds. O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the messenger, and do not invalidate your deeds. Indeed, those who disbelieved and averted people from the path of Allah and then died while they were disbelievers, never will Allah forgive them. So do not weaken and call for peace while you are superior, and Allah is with you and will never deprive you of the reward of your deeds." This worldly life is only amusement and diversion, and if you believe and fear Allah, he will give you your reward and not ask you for your properties. If he should ask you for them and press you, you would withhold and he would expose your hatred, i.e. unwillingness. Here you are, those invited to spend in the cause of Allah, 
but among you are those who withhold out of greed, and whoever withholds only withholds benefit from himself. And Allah is the free of need while you are the needy. And if you turn away, i.e. refuse, he will replace you with another people, then they will not be the likes of you. Now, interestingly enough, um, verse 36 here uh, and 37, I would like to visit the tafsir on because it piqued my curiosity. So let me just get us there quickly. Okay. Thirty-six and thirty-seven. Okay, so let's see how these are chunked up. Okay, perfect. This passage is aimed at taking his slaves, uh, his slaves, his. Uh, this passage is aimed at making his slaves lose interest in the life of this world by telling them of its reality, for it is no more than play and distraction. It is play in a physical sense and a distraction to their hearts and minds. For a person keeps being distracted by his wealth, children, and well-being, and by pleasures such as physical pleasure, food, drink, houses, gatherings, showing off, and leadership, playing, and doing all kinds of deeds that are of no benefit. Rather, he is wasting his time in idleness, negligence, and heedlessness until his time in this world comes to an end and he is faced with his death. Then suddenly all this, all these things disappear and leave him without him ha having gained anything from them. Rather, he will realize his loss and deprivation, and his punishment will be presented to him. This dictates that the wise man should show no interest in worldly gain, have no desire for it, and pay no attention to worldly matters. Rather, what he should do is pay attention to what is mentioned here. But if you believe and guard against evil by believing in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, and the last day, and you fear him, which is one of the requirements of faith, and you strive constantly and consistently to please him and avoid disobeying him, this is what will benefit a person, and this is what he should comp uh, compete in and focus all his ambition and efforts on seeking. This is what Allah wants from his slaves, out of compassion and kindness towards them, so that he may reward them abundantly. Hence he says, but if you believe and guard against evil, he will grant you your rewards. He does not ask for all your wealth. That is, he does not want to impose on you that which is too difficult for you and will cause you hardship by taking all of your wealth and leaving you with nothing or taking so much of it that it will cause you harm. Hence he says, if he were to ask you for it and insist that you give it all, you would covetously withhold and that could lead to ill will. That is developing resentment. If he were to ask you to give what you do not want to give, the evidence for that fact is uh, that if Allah were to ask you to give your wealth and insist that you give it all, you would withhold it, is the fact that you are being called to spend in Allah's cause in this manner, which in your religious and worldly interests, uh, which is in your religious and worldly interests. But among you are some who are miserly. So how about if he were to ask you for all of your wealth for a purpose of which you cannot see the immediate benefits, is it not more likely that you would refuse to give? Then he says, but the one who is miserly is miserly only towards his own self because he is depriving himself of the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and missing out on much goodness, and he will never harm Allah in the slightest by his refusal to spend. Okay. Beautiful explanation. I also want to, again, my own personal reflection on this, it's do what you can, right? So Islam is a middle way, meaning you are allowed to go and rest yourself. You, you're allowed to go. So, and you can make it a form of ibadah, by the way, meaning you can make rest a form of worship. If your intention is to rest so that you can wake up the next day, or if your intention is to like relax so that you can get inspired to go learn more Quran or read more Hadith or uh, get more knowledge about Islam, now it's all a form of ibadah. But if you're just, you know, the, the, the um, reference here in the Hadith, again, on my own personal reflection, is talking about those people that are just doing nothing but playing, like nothing at all. And then when they are resting, they are resting for the purposes of playing more. They're not resting for the purposes of like 
Let me re-energize. So like you can, you know, eating can be an Ibada. Going to the restroom can be a form of Ibada. Uh, uh, entertainment, uh, halal form of entertainment is a form of Ibada, right? Because you need to, your, your body has rights over you. Okay, so that's the the kind of personal reflection that I have over this. It's not a sense now that you have to be praying 24-7 and you have to be memorizing Quran 24-7. And the second that you're not doing something like that, you should feel guilty. No, that's not the case at all. Okay. All right, beautiful. Uh, carrying on with the reading. So we conclude this. And coincidentally, that is uh, the end of that chapter. All right. Here we go with the next chapter, uh, Surah Al-Fatih. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Indeed, we have given you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a clear conquest that Allah may forgive for you what preceded of your sin, i.e., errors, and what will follow and complete His favor upon you and guide you to a straight path. Now, remember, we believe that uh, the prophets are masum, meaning that they are sinless; they don't commit any major sins. But anything that is a form of a mistake is considered a sin on their part. So once again, I had mentioned if there was something, if there was two options that the prophet at the time had, and one of them was better, and he chose the lesser of the better, that's considered a sin. So like greeting someone with a smile compared to greeting someone without a smile, right? Um, carrying on. And, and that Allah may aid you with a mighty victory. It is he who sent down tranquility into the hearts of the believers that they would increase in faith along with their present faith. And to Allah belong the soldiers of the heavens and the earth, and ever is Allah knowing and wise. And that he may admit the believing men and the believing women to gardens beneath which rivers flow to abide therein eternally and remove from them their misdeeds. And ever is that in the sight of Allah a great attainment. <laughs> And that he may punish the hypocrite men and the hypocrite women and the polytheist men and polytheist women. Those who assume about Allah an assumption of evil nature, upon them is a misfortune of evil nature, and Allah has become angry with them and has cursed them and prepared them, uh, prepared for them hell. And evil is it as a destination. And to Allah belong the soldiers of the heavens and the earth, and ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. Indeed, we have sent you as a witness and as a harbinger and as a, excuse me, as a bringer of good tidings and a warner that you people may believe in Allah and his messenger and honor him and respect him, i.e. the Prophet and exalt him, i.e. Allah, morning and afternoon. So <clears throat> this is one of the beautiful things about the Arabic language is it has the ability to switch um, on who the subject and who the object is, right? It's very difficult to do this in English. So this is why these uh, bracketed forms of uh, translation are super important, right? Because it says him, 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 right? But it switches between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it switches between the Prophet and the Prophet. So um, just a wonderful, wonderful translation there. Carrying on. Indeed, those who pledge allegiance to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they are actually pledging allegiance to Allah. The hand of Allah is over their hands. So he who breaks his word only breaks it to the determination uh, to the detriment of himself. And he who fulfills that which he has promised Allah, he will give him a great reward. Those who remain behind of the Bedouins will say to you, our properties and our families occupied us, so ask forgiveness for us. They say with their tongues what is not within their hearts. Say, then who could prevent Allah at all if he intended for you harm or intended for you benefit? Rather, ever is Allah of what you do aware. Meaning, don't try to fake it to make it. You know, if you're not going to do something, just be straight up with it and say, you know what, I'm not going to do it. Don't try to be a, you know, like some weasel. But you thought that the messenger and the believers would never return to their families ever. And that was made pleasing in your hearts. So not only that, but they had a, a, a great degree of hypocrisy within their hearts, right? And you assumed an assumption of evil and pe became a people ruined. And whoever has not believed in Allah and his messenger, then indeed we have prepared for the disbelievers a blaze. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. He forgives whom he wills and punishes whom he wills. And ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. 
Those who remained behind will say, when you set outwards the war booty to take it, let us follow you. They wish to change the words of a law. Say, never will you follow us. Thus did a law say before. So they will say, rather you envy us. But in fact, they were not understanding except a little. So uh, again, worth visiting the Tefsir here. And this is verse uh, 15. The context is pretty clear, but sometimes it's good just to get um, a little bit of a deeper insight. So having mentioned and criticized those who lag behind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now mentions their worldly punishment. When the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions set out to collect the spoils for which there was no fighting involved in seizing them, these people asked to be allowed to join them and have a share, saying, allow us to follow you, they want thereby to change the word, which is the promise of Allah, as he decreed punishment for them, and that only the believing companions should get a share of these spoils, as Allah decreed that in terms of both religious rulings and the divine decree, say to them, you shall not follow us. Allah has already decreed that you are, of the, uh, are to be deprived of it because you wrong yourselves and because you failed to fight the first time. Uh, they will say in response to these words by which they are out, they are preventing from going out. You begrudged us a share of the spoils out of jealousy. This is the best they, that they could come up with concerning this matter. If they were mature enough, they would have realized that their deprived, uh, their being deprived of a share was because of their own sin, and that sins have consequences in both worldly and spiritual terms. Hence, Allah says, rather they understand only a little. And there is a note here saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised the spoils of Khaybar exclusively to the Muslims who were pre present at Al Hudaybiyah. But those who had lagged behind wanted to join the Khaybar campaign in hopes of acquiring a share of the spoils. Hence, in this verse, he states that this will not be allowed. So, Absolutely beautiful explanation and, and, um, and even more uh, context. And then um, there is just a little bit more, but this is on the next page. So let me read it first and we'll see if it's worth delving into the tips here. Say to those who remain behind of the Bedouins, you will be called to face a people of great military might. You may fight them or they will submit. Uh, so if you obey a law, so if you obey, Allah will give you a good reward. But if you turn away as you, as you turned away before, he will punish you with a painful punishment. There is not upon the blind any guilt or upon the lame any guilt or upon the ill any guilt for remaining behind. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, he will admit him to gardens beneath which rivers flow. But whoever turns away, he will punish him with a painful punishment. And once again, you see the mercy in Islam that only if you're capable to fight, uh, then come forth. The tafsir says here, uh, having mentioned those Bedouins who lagged behind from jihad in his cause and who gave invalid excuses and asked to go out with the Muslims when there was no fighting involved just for the purpose of getting a share of the spoils, Allah said to them by, the, by way of testing them, say to the Bedouin who lagged behind you, uh, you will be called upon to fight a people formidable in warfare. That is, the Messenger والسلام, and those who take his place among the rightly guided caliphs and rulers will call you to fight. Those people who they were to be called upon to fight were the Persians, Romans, and others of their ilk. And you will fight them unless they submit. That is, either one or the other will happen. This describes the real situation for when they engaged them and fought them as these people were still formidable in warfare. In that situation, they did not accept to pay the jizya. Rather, they would either enter Islam or fight in defense of their religion to which they chose to adhere. But when the Muslims defeated them and they grew weak and submitted their lost strength, therefore their options were either to become Muslim or to pay the jizya. So notice it was the people's, it was the kingdom's mentality, meaning uh, that empire, the Roman empire was strong. And they said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna pay this jizya. yet. So they didn't even have an option, right? Because it's this lower force, this smaller force fighting this massive force of uh, Romans. Uh, then if you obey the one who calls you to fight these people, Allah will grant you a goodly reward, which is the reward that Allah and his messenger have connected to jihad in Allah's cause. 
But if you turn away, as you did before, when you turned away from fighting those whom the messenger Sallallahu called you to fight, he will afflict you with a painful punishment. This verse is indicative of the virtue of the rightly guided caliphs who called for jihad against people who were formidable in warfare and that it was obligatory to obey them in that regard. Then Allah mentions valid reasons that excuse a person from going into jihad, and these were uh, the reasons that I had mentioned. Um, there is also a footnote coming up here, uh, so keep in mind of this footnote. The Prophet Sallallahu had sent Uthman radiallahu anhu to Mecca to speak with Quraysh and tell them that the Muslims had come in at peace for the sole purpose of performing Umrah, but they detained him for so long that the Muslims thought that they might have murdered him, which would constitute an act of war. Hence the Prophet Sallallahu standing under a tree, accepted their oaths of allegiance and pledged to fight if need be and never flee. So this is in reference to the verses that are coming up. Uh, so uh, verse 18, certainly was Allah pleased with the believers when they pledged allegiance to you. So this is exactly what that allegiance is talking about. Um, o Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, under the tree, and he knew what was in their heart. So he sent down tranquility upon them and rewarded them with an imminent conquest and much war booty, which uh, they will take. And ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. <coughs> Allah has promised you much booty that you will take in the future and has hastened for you this victory and withheld the hands of people from you, that it may be a sign for the believers and that he may guide you to a straight path. And he promised other victories that you were so far unable to realize, which Allah has already encompassed. And ever is Allah over all things competent. And if those Meccans who disbelieve had fought you, they would have turned their backs retreating. Then they would not find a protector or a helper. This is the established way of Allah, which has occurred before. And never will you find in the way of Allah any change. Meaning there was strife, there was struggle, there was a need for conquest in the sense to protect the messengers uh, previously and obviously the Rasul and you'll notice that the, the way of Allah never changes, meaning the victory always belongs to Allah. Never, ever, ever was, uh, uh, was Allah put into a position where the victory was not his, period. Okay. <clears throat> and it is he who withheld their hands from you and your hands from them within the area of Mecca after he caused you to overcome them. And ever is Allah of what you do seen. They are the ones who disbelieved and obstructed you from al-Masjid al-Haram while the offering was prevented from reaching its place of sacrifice. And if not for believing men and believing women whom you did not know, that you might trample, i.e. kill them, and there would befall you because of their dishonor without your knowledge, you would have been permitted to enter Mecca. This was so that Allah might admit to his mercy whom he willed if they had been part uh, if they had been apart from them we would have punished those who disbelieved among them with a painful punishment so let's head over to the 25th verse uh, just to gain a little bit of context here so let's see Okay, here it says, it is also they who prevented the offerings from uh, reaching their place of sacrifice, which is a place where they are to be slaughtered, namely Mecca. They prevented them from reaching it wrongfully and out of enmity. All of these matters are reasons to fight them. And it's, he's talking about the polytheists here. Uh, but then uh, it is also they who prevented the, uh, yeah, okay. But then there uh, was a reason not to fight them, which was the presence of believing men and women among the polytheists. They were not living par apart from them in a separate place, such that harm would not reach them. Were it not for these believing men and women whom the Muslims did not know and whom they might have trampled underfoot, in other words, were it not for fear that they might be trampled underfoot and thus unwittingly uh, incurred a burden of sin that would result from fighting them and causing them harm and injury, Allah would have commanded you to fight the disbelievers. So notice, because there was believers in the area, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved everybody, okay? 
There is also another benefit from not fighting, which is uh, so that Allah might admit to his mercy whomever he willed and bless them with faith after disbelief and guidance after misguidance. Therefore, he prevented them from fighting them for this reason, which, again, makes perfect sense to me. Wonderful. And those who disbelieved had put into their hearts uh, chauvinism, the chauvinism of the time of ignorance. But Allah sent down his tranquility upon his messenger and upon the believers and imposed upon them the word of righteousness. And they were more deserving of it and worthy of it. And ever is Allah of all things knowing. Uh, if you don't know the definition of chauvinistic, go ahead and check it out. But basically, it's just like a, a type of arrogance, right? Certainly has Allah showed to his messenger the vision, i.e. dream, in truth. You will surely enter al Masjid al-Haram, if Allah wills, <clears throat> in safety with your heads shaved and hair shortened. Not fearing anyone, he knew that you did not, he knew what you did not know and has arranged before that a conquest near at hand. It is he who sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to manifest it over all religion and sufficient is Allah as witness. Carrying on. Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah, and those with him are forced, are forceful against the disbelievers, merciful amongst themselves, uh, uh, merciful among themselves. You see them bowing and prostrating in prayer, seeking bounty from Allah and his pleasure. Their sign is their faces from the effects of prostration, i.e. prayer. So they would have a, a mark on their forehead, right, from uh, being on the sand. That is their description in the Torah, and their description in the gospel is as a plant which produces its offshoots and strengthens them so they grow firm and stand upon their stalks, delighting the, so the sowers, so that he, i.e. Allah, may enrage by them the disbelievers. Allah has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds among them forgiveness and a great reward. So here we have uh, the, the best of promisers giving you a promise, right? <clears throat> and what a better position to be in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those uh, righteous people that earn his forgiveness and that great reward that he has set aside. Um, okay, wonderful. Next up, Surah Al-Hujurat. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. O you who have believed, do not put yourselves before Allah and his messenger, but fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is hearing and knowing. O you who have believed, do not raise your voices above the voice of the prophet or be loud to him in speech like the loudness of some of you to others, lest your deeds become worthless while you perceive not. Indeed, those who lower their voices before the messenger of Allah, they are the ones whose heart Allah has tested for righteousness. For them is forgiveness and great reward. Indeed, those who call you, O Muhammad وسلم, from behind the chambers, most of them do not use reason. And if they had been patient until you could come out to them, it would have been better for them. But Allah is forgiving and merciful. Worth checking out the tafsir here to see if we have any insight as to who that was. Um, so let's take a quick look. Uh, this is... Verses four and five. Okay. And there is also um, a story of Hudaybiyah, which is, it might be worth reading this uh, to you guys. So let me, let me read this portion too, uh, just to give us a little bit of insights. Okay, so here's the, the story of Al-Hudaybiyah, just to give us some, some additional insights. Here we will tell the story of Al-Hudaybiyah at length as narrated by Imam Shamsuddin ibn Al-Qayyim in Al-Hadi Al-Nabawi. As this will help us to understand this surah which speaks of this event, he, may Allah be uh, pleased with him and have mercy on him, said the story of Al-Hudaybiyah. Nafi'i said that it occurred in Dhul, uh, Dhul Qadda, uh, 6AH, which is the correct view. This is the view of Az-Zuhri, uh, Qatada, Musa ibn uh, Uqba, Muhammad ibn Ishaq, and others. Hishab ibn Urwa said, narrating from his father, radiallahu anhuma, 
may Allah be pleased with both of them, uh, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam set out for Al Hudaybiyah in Ramadan. But in fact, it was in Shawab. This is a mistake on his part. It was the conquest of Mecca that occurred during Ramadan. Abdul Aswad said, narrating from Urwa, that it occurred in Dhul Qada, uh, according to the correct view. In As Sahihain, uh, it is narrated from Anas that the Prophet وسلم, performed Umrah four times, all of them in uh, Dhul Qada, and he mentioned the Umrah of Al Hudaybiyah as one of them when he was accompanied by 1,500 believers. This was also narrated in as Sahihain. Uh, excuse me, as Sahihain from Jabir. In the same books, it was narrated from uh, Abdullah ibn Abi Awfa that they were 1300. So there's a, a small di discrepancy on the number. Qatada said, I said to Sa'id ibn al Musayyib, how many were the people who were present at uh, Bayat al Ridwan? He said 1,500. I said, Jabir ibn Abdullah said that there were 1,400. He said, may Allah have mercy on him. He must be mistaken, for it was he who told me that they were 1,500. I said, both views are narrated soundly from Jabir, and it was narrated soundly from him that in the years of Al-Hudaybiyah, they slaughtered 70 camels, and one camel may be sacrificed on behalf of seven people. It was said to him, how many were you? He said, 1,400 on horseback and on foot. One feels more at ease with this view, namely that they were 1400, and this is the view of Al Bara ibn Azib, uh, Maqil ibn Yasir, Salama ibn Aqwa, uh, uh, According to the more sound of the two reports, and Al Musayyib ibn Hazan, Shu'aib said, narrating from Qatada from Sa'id ibn Al Musayyib, from his father, we were with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam beneath the tree 1400 men. Those who say that they were 700 are clearly mistaken. The reason for their mistake is that on that day, they slaughtered 70 camels, and it was stated that a camel is sufficient for seven or 10 men. But this is not in harmony with what he stated concerning their number because he stated that a camel was slaughtered during his campaign on behalf of seven. So if the 70 camels were for all of them, they would have been 1,490 men. Uh, but at the end of the same hadith, he said that they were 1,400. When they were in Dhul Hulayfa, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam garlanded and marked his sacrifice, a sacrificial camel and entered Ihram for Umrah. He sent a spy from Khuza'a ahead of him to find out about Quraysh for him. And when they were near Usfan, the spy came and said, I have just left Kab ibn Luay. They, were, they have gathered the uh, Habish, which are some Arab tribes, and many others against you. And they want to fight you and bar you from reaching the Kaaba. The Prophet ﷺ consulted his companions and asked them, Do you think we should attack the land of these people who are supporting Quraysh? Or should we head towards the house and whoever tries to bar us from it, we should fight them? Abu Bakr said, Allah and his messenger know best. Rather, we have come to perform Umrah, and we have not come to fight anyone. But whoever prevents us from reaching the, the house, we should fight them. So the Prophet ﷺ said, then let us move on. So uh, they moved on until when they were part away there, the Prophet ﷺ said, Khalid ibn Walid is in Al-Ghumayn uh, uh, Al uh, with the cavalry of Quraysh. Go to the right. The narrator said, by Allah, Khalid did not realize that they were there until he saw the dust of the oncoming army. So he rushed to warn Quraysh. Remember, Khalid ibn Walid was on the opposing side. He wasn't a believer yet, right? The Prophet ﷺ continued on until when he was in the mountain pass from which he would come down upon them. His mount sat down. The people said, move, move, but it would not move. They Then they said, Al-Qaswa is being obstinate. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Qaswa is not being obstinate, for that is not her nature. What is restraining her is the same thing that restrained the elephant. Then he said, by the one in whose hand is my soul, they will not ask for any deal that is based on venerating what Allah has made sacred, but I will agree to it. He prodded his camel and she jumped up and he turned back and camped in the farthest part of Al-Hudaybiyah beside a well that had a little water. The, 
People took the water a little at a time, but they soon used it up and they complained of thirst to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He took an arrow from his quiver and instructed them to put it in the well. By Allah, it kept flowing with what they needed of water until they moved it. So here was a miracle that was conducted by the Prophet Quraysh got worried because of his uh, coming down towards them. So the Messenger of Allah وسلم, went to send one of his companions to them. He sem- summoned Umar ibn al-Khattab in order to send him. But Omar said, O Messenger of Allah, there is no one of Banu Kab in Mecca who could defend me if they want to harm me. Send Uthman ibn Affan instead, for his clan is there and he will be able to tell them whatever you want. So the Messenger of Allah summoned Uthman ibn Affan and sent him to Quraysh saying, Tell them that we have not come to fight. We have only come to perform Umrah and call them to Islam. So they were inviting them to the deen of the Prophet the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they were trying to establish very clearly that they're not trying to fight. He instructed him to go uh, get some believing men and women in Mecca and give them the glad tidings of victory and tell them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would cause his religion to prevail in Mecca so that no one would have to conceal his faith in that city. Uthman set out and passed by Quraysh uh, in Balda. They said, where are you going? He said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has sent me to call you to Allah and to Islam and to tell you that we have not come to fight, rather we have come to perform Umrah. They said, we have heard what you say, you may carry on. So they permitted him. Uh, Aban ibn Sa'id ibn, uh, ibn al-As stood up to welcome him. He put a saddle on his horse and seated Uthman on the horse, declaring that he was under his protection when Aban rode behind Uthman. Uh, until they came to Mecca. Before Uthman came back, the Muslims said, Uthman is the first one of us to reach the Kaaba and circum- circumambulate it. But the Messenger of Allah says, I do not think he will circumambulate the Kaaba when we are detained and prevented from doing so. And he's not going to start his tawaf while everybody else is in the back. They said, what is there to prevent him from doing that, O Messenger of Allah, when he has reached it? He said, that is what I think he will not circumambulate the Kaaba unless we circumambulate it with him. So like, why would you leave your, your brotherhood behind? And the Muslims approached the polytheists to discuss a peace deal. A man from one of the two groups threw something at a man from the other side and a skirmish took place in which they shot arrows and threw stones at one another. And the two groups shouted at one another and detained whomever they found of the other party. The Messenger of Allah heard that Uthman had been killed, so he called the Muslims to swear allegiance to him. The messenger, the, the Muslims rushed to the Messenger of Allah. Now remember, that was that footnote that I was discussing previously. The Messenger, uh, the Muslims rushed to the Messenger of Allah, who was beneath a tree and swore allegiance to him, pledging not to flee. Then the Messenger of Allah took hold of his own hand and said, This is on behalf of Uthman. When the oath of allegiance was complete, Uthman came back and the Muslims said to him, Have you had your fill, O Abu Abdullah, of circumambulating the Kaaba? He said, How ill you think of me. By the one in whose hand is my soul, even if I stayed there for a year and the Messenger of Allah وسلم, stayed in Al Hudaybiyah, I would not circumambulate it until the Messenger of Allah did so. Quraysh invited me to circumambulate the Kaaba, but I refused. The Muslims said, The Messenger of Allah is the most knowledgeable of us about Allah and the most positive in thinking. Omar had taken the land, had taken the hand of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to swear allegiance to him under the tree, and all Muslims swore allegiance except Al Jad ibn Qais. Uh, Maqib ibn Yasir held a branch up away from the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The first one to swear allegiance to him was Abu Sinan al Asadi. Salama ibn al Aqwa swore allegiance to him three times among the first uh, group of people the middle group, and the last group. Whilst they were like that, Budayl ibn Warqa al khuzat I came with a group of Khuza'a, which is a tribe, uh, who were sincere advisors to the Messenger of Allah from among the people of Tihama. 
and said, I have just seen Kab ibn Lu'ay and Amr ibn Lu'ay camped by the profuse water of al Hudaybiyah. They have uh, milched camels with them, and they intend to fight you and bar you from reaching the Kaaba. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, we have not come to fight anyone, rather we have come to perform Umrah. War has weakened Quraysh, and they have suffered great losses. If they wish, I will conclude a truce with them, and they must refrain from interfering between me and the people. And if I prevail, then they may decide whether they want to enter Islam as the people have done. If not, they will have rested and regained their strength and will be able to resume fighting me. Notice that. If it, he's saying they're too tired and beat up from their previous excursions, so I'm not going to fight them, right? And if they want to rest up and fight, okay, cool. Then by the one in whose hand is my soul, I will surely fight them in defense of this cause of mine until I am killed or Allah causes his religion to prevail meaning it's do or die. But notice, if anybody says that he's a warlord, a stuff for the law, first off, and second off, a warlord wouldn't say, oh yeah, uh, these guys are tired, so I'm not going to fight them. No, he's going to capitalize on the fact that somebody's in a weakened state, right? Budel said, I will convey your words to them. He set out until he came to Quraysh and said to them, I have come to you from this man, and I heard him say something. If you wish, I will tell you about it. The foolish ones among them said, we have no need for you to tell us anything about him. But the wise ones among them said, tell us what you heard. He said, I heard him say such and such. Urwa ibn Masud Athakafi uh, uh, said, this man was offered, uh, this man has offered you a reasonable proposal. So accept it and let me go talk to him. They said, go to him. So he came to him and began to talk to him, and the Prophet ﷺ said to him something similar to what he said to Budayl. Whereupon Orwa said, O oh Muhammad, do you want to eradicate your own people? Have you ever heard of anyone amongst the Arabs uh, who destroyed his own people? If you insist on fighting, then by Allah, I am looking at the people's faces and I see a collection of riffraff, the type who would flee and abandon you. Abu Bakr said, Suck. Uh, suck the teeth of a lat. <laughs> That's funny. Do you think uh, we would flee and abandon him? He said, who is this? Uh, he said, Abu Bakr. He said, by the one in whose hand is my soul, were it not for a favor that I still owe you and have not yet returned, I would have answered you. So the reason why Abu Bakr uh, <laughs> reacted that way is because his honor is being challenged, right? And these are very honorable people, so much so that they would stake their own lives on their honor. Every time the Prophet started speaking, Orwa reached out for his beard. al mughira ibn Shu'ayb, uh, excuse me, al mughira ibn Shu'bah, uh, was besides the Prophet and had a sword with him and was wearing a helmet. Every time Orwa reached to grab the Prophet's beard, uh, al mughira struck his hand with the hand of his sword and said, keep your hand away from the beard of the Messenger Orwa raised his head and said, who is this? He said, al mughira ibn Shu'bah. He said, O oh, betrayer, am I not still striving to protect you from the consequences of your treachery? And Murira had uh, accompanied some people during the Jahidiyyah. Then he had killed them and taken their property. Then he came and entered Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, As for your Islam, I accept it. As for the property, I do not want anything of it. Then Urwa started watching the companions of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And by Allah, the Prophet ﷺ did not spit, but it fell into the hands of one of them. And he rubbed it on his skin and face. Now, obviously, they see that he's a messenger of God, so everything that he is conducting is is holy and and so on. So there's uh, customs that are that are taking place here. If he instructed them to do something, they hastened to obey his command. When they did wudu, they almost fought over his leftover water. When he spoke, they lowered their voices in his presence and they refrained from looking at him out of respect. Orwa went back to his companions and said, "O oh people, by Allah, I have visited kings." Uh, Chosroses and Caesar and the Negus. But by Allah, I have never seen any king whose companions venerate him as the companions of Muhammad venerate Muhammad. By Allah, he does not spit, but it falls in the hands of one of them and he rubs his face and skin with it. If he instructs them to do something, they hasten to obey his command. 
When he does wudu, they almost fight over his leftover water. When he speaks, they lower their voices in his presence and they refrain from looking at him out of respect. He has offered you a reasonable proposal, so accept it. Uh, a man from Banu, uh, Banu, Kinana, Banu Kinana says, let me go to him. So they said, go to him. When he approached the Prophet, والسلام, the messenger of Allah وسلم, says, this is so and so. He is from a people who venerated the sacrificial camels. So send them in his direction. So they sent them and the people met him reciting uh, Talbiyah. When he saw that, he said, glory be to Allah. These people should not be pre prevented from reaching the Kaaba. He went back to his companions and said, I saw the sacrificial camels have been garlanded and marked, and I do not think that they should be barred from reaching the Kaaba. Mikraz ibn Hafs stood up and said, let me go to him. So they said, go to him. When he approached them, the Prophet him says, this is Mikraz ibn Hafs. He is a vicious man. He started speaking to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and whilst he was speaking to him, Suhail ibn Amr came and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, uh, said, no matter, now the matter has uh, become easy. He said, come, let us have a deal written down between us and you. He called for the scribe and said, write in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Suhail said, as for the most gracious, by Allah, we do not know what this is. Rather, we write in your name, O Allah, as you used to write. The Muslims said, by Allah, we will not write anything except in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. The Prophet وسلم, said, write in your name, O Allah. Then he says, write. This, uh, this is what has been agreed to by Muhammad, the messenger of Allah. So Hayat said, by Allah, if we knew that you were the messenger of Allah, we would not have barred you from reaching the Kaaba and we would not have fought you. Rather write Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, indeed, I am the messenger of Allah. Even if you deny me, write Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Then the Prophet uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that you uh, will allow us to go to the Kaaba and circumambulate it. So Hayat said, by Allah, we do not want the Arabs to say that we yielded to pressure, but you can have that next year. So he wrote it down. So Hayat said, no man of ours will come to you even if he follows your religion, but you will return him to us. The Muslims said, SubhanAllah, how can he be returned to the polytheist when he has become, uh, when he has come to, as a Muslim? Whilst they were like that, Abu Jandal ibn Suhail came dragging his chains, having escaped from the other side of Mecca and went to the Muslims seeking their protection. Suhail said, this is the first one I ask you to return on the basis of our deal, meaning that there was a slave that was um, going uh, and, and fleeing and seeking the protection of the Muslims. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, we have not concluded the deal yet. So Hayat said, then in the case, I will not make any deal with you. The Prophet said, let him off for my sake. He said, I will not let him off. He said, do it. Uh, he said, I will not do it. Abu Jandal said, oh Muslims, am I, uh, am I to be returned to the polytheists when I have come as a Muslim? Do you not see that I have been suffering? For he had been tortured severely for the sake of Allah. Omar ibn al-Khattab said, I never had any doubts since I became Muslim except on that day. I came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, are you not the Prophet of Allah? He said, indeed I am. I said, are we not following the truth and our enemies following falsehood? He said, indeed. I said, how can we accept a deal that is humiliating for our religion and go back before Allah decides between us and our enemy? He said, verily, I am the Messenger of Allah and he will cause me to prevail and I will not disobey him. I said, did you not tell us that we would come to the Kaaba and circumambulate it? He said, indeed I did. But did I tell you that you would come uh, to it this year? I said, no. He said, you will surely come to it and circumambulate it. Then I went to Abu Bakr and said to him what I had said to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abu Bakr replied exactly as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had replied. And he added, so stay close to him until you die, for by Allah, he is on the path of truth. Omar said, I did many good deeds in hope of expiating that. When he has uh, finished writing the treaty, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, get up and offer your sacrifices and shave your heads. By Allah, not one man among them got up even after he had said that three times. 
when none of them got up, he got up and went to Um Salama, radiallahu anha, and may Allah be pleased with her, and told her how the people had responded. She said, O Messenger of Allah, do you want that to be done? Go out and do not say a word to anyone until you slaughter your camel and call your barber to shave your head. So he got up, went out, and he did not speak to anyone among them until he had done that. He slaughtered his camel and called his barber to shave his head. When the people saw that, they got up and slaughtered their camels, and they started shaving one another's heads to the point that some of them almost killed one another out of distress. Then some believe, uh, some believing women came, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the words, O oh, you who believe, when believing women come to you as migrants, test their sincerity. Although Allah knows best as to the sincerity of their faith, then if you determine that they are sincere believers, do not send them back to the disbelievers. They are not lawful wives for the disbelievers, nor are the disbelievers lawful husbands for them. Do not hold on to marriage ties with disbelieving women. And, um, and that is uh, chapter 60, verse 10 of the Quran, Surah Muntahana. Uh, on that day, Omar divorced two wives of his who were polytheists. Muawiyah married one of them, and Safwan ibn Umayyah married the other. Then the Prophet ﷺ returned to Medina. On the way back, Allah revealed to him the words, Verily we have granted you, O Muhammad wasallam, in the treaty of Al-Hudaybiyah, a manifest victory. Omar said, Is it a victory, O Messenger of Allah? He said, Yes. The companion said, Congratulations to you, O Messenger of Allah, but what about us? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the words, It is he who has sent down the reassurance to the hearts of the believers so that they might increase in faith. A very lengthy explanation, but a very detailed and very much so um, worth uh, delving into that tafsir, right? So greatly appreciate your patience to that. But now you see just how sensitive the matter was. And it wasn't one person that he negotiated with. It was multiple people. And it wasn't one personality in agreement. It was multiple personalities. Some of them were, were leaning towards him and saying, this is indeed the messenger of Allah. And then you have the pure opposition where a, a per person was vicious and vile. And then you had the scribes taking place and you, you see how things step by step, he had to come to terms with people, right? So remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he's the best example for mankind, just look at the iterative process that took place between the Prophet and his enemies in order to avoid an unnecessary loss of life on both sides, right? On both sides. And he had the military strength and he had the conditioning to literally run them over, right? But but uh, innocent lives would have been lost and sin would have been uh, um, acquired, right? And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners, right? Okay, perfect. So let's carry on uh, the reading where we left off. So um, we uh, touched up uh, on verse number 29 in that uh, deep explanation. Next up, Surah Al-Hujurat. Uh, o you who have believed, do not put yourselves before Allah and his messenger. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. O you who have believed, do not put yourselves before Allah and his messenger, but fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is hearing and knowing. O you who have believed, do not raise your voices above the voice of the prophet or be loud to him in speech like the loudness of some of you out there, lest your deeds become worthless while you perceive not. Uh, indeed, those who lower their voices before the messenger of Allah, they are the ones whose heart Allah has tested for righteousness. For them is forgiveness and a great reward. Indeed, those who call you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from behind the chambers, most of them do not use reason. Okay. And I know I, I covered these, but it, it's, you know, there was an extensive read and it's worth recovering them. And if they had not been patient until you could come out to them, it would have been better for them. But Allah is forgiving and merciful. O oh, you who have believed, if there comes to you a disobedient one with information, investigate, lest you harm a people out of ignorance <clears throat> and become over what you have done regretful. Now, interestingly enough, this is wildly uh, applicable to today. Meaning you have all these people that are Islamophobes spitting, spitting out a bunch of nonsense. And then all of a sudden, you know, rear, rear, and people start losing their minds, right? Uh, don't learn Islam from Islamophobes. Don't learn Islam from people without knowledge, especially non-Muslims. It's just the stupidest thing that you could possibly do in life. 
uh, and know that among you is the messenger of Allah. If he were to obey you in much of the matter, you would be in difficulty. But Allah has endear, uh, endeared to you the faith and has made it pleasing in your hearts and has made hateful to you disbelief, defiance, and disobedience. Those are the rightly guided. Now notice, this exact condition is where we all strive to be, to the point where our prayers are not becoming a task, they're becoming a desire, to the point where fasting is not a task, it's becoming a desire, to the point where charity is not a task, it's becoming a desire, you know, and um, you have this reinforcement, right? But you have to work towards that. I mean, you, uh, it's like climbing a, a hill first, but then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, when you yourself feel that you're you, you're strengthened in your resolve and your belief, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates that opening where it no longer becomes a task. And then if you miss a prayer, you're like, oh man, I, I feel like something's missing. Like, you know, you feel guilty and so on. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease that for us and make us of those people that are really firm to the point where we find joy in doing these things. Now to the outside world, we look like a bunch of crazy people. Uh, really, these guys starve themselves. They pray five times a day. You know, they're, you know, what? Okay, but to us, we're enjoying it, right? So, um, you know, just keep, just keep working on yourselves, guys. It is, uh, it is as bounty from a law and favor, and a law is knowing and wise. And if two faction amongst the believers should fight, then make settlement between the two. But if one of them oppresses the other, then fight against the one who has. Uh, the one that oppresses until it returns the ordinance of Allah. And if it returns, then make settlement between them in justice and act justly. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. The believers are but brothers, so make settlement between your brothers. And fear Allah uh, that you may receive mercy. O you who have believed, let not a people ridicule another people. Perhaps they may be better than them, nor let women ridicule other women. Perhaps they may be better than them. And do not insult one another and do not call each other by offensive names. Wretched is that is the name, i.e. mention of disobedience after one's faith. And whoever does not repent, then it is those who are the wrongdoers. And what a beautiful form of guidance, right? Absolutely beautiful form of guidance. Okay, carrying on. O you who have believed, avoid much negative assumptions. Indeed, some assumption is sin. Uh, and do not spy or backbite each other. Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his brother when dead? You would detest it and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is accepting of repentance and merciful. O mankind, indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is all-knowing and aware. And notice here, this is the differences. Uh, black, white, you know, Chinese, U.S., African, doesn't matter. Made in different tribes, speak different languages, and we're, we're instructed to get to know one another. The Bedouins say, we have believed, say you have not yet believed, but say instead we have submitted for faith has not yet entered your hearts. And if you obey Allah and his messenger, he will not deprive you from your deeds of anything. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Now, there's a, a, a status and a level of attainment when it comes to belief, right? Submission is one thing, putting in the ritualistic practices, following the roots, um, being good, and following the instructions and the guidelines will lead that opening towards belief. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us of a, a good, clean, sound heart that is upon belief. The believers are only the ones who have believed in Allah and his messenger and then doubt not, but strive with their properties and their lives in the cause of Allah. It is those who are the truthful. Say, would you acquaint Allah with your religion while Allah knows <coughs> whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth? And Allah is knowing of all things. They consider it a favor to you that they have accepted Islam. Say, do not consider your Islam a favor to me. Rather, Allah has conferred favor upon you that he has guided you to the faith if you should be truthful. Indeed, Allah knows the unseen aspects of the heavens and the earth and Allah is seeing of what you do. Wonderful. Carrying on, this is Surah Qaf. 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Qaf. By the honored Quran, but they wonder that there has come to them a warner from among themselves, and the disbelievers say, this is an amazing thing. When we uh, have died and have become dust, we will return to life. This is a distant, i.e. unlikely return. We know what the earth diminishes, i.e. consumes of them, and with us is a retaining record. But they deny the truth when it came to them. <coughs> so they are in a confused condition. Have they not looked at the heaven of, of them, how we structured it and adorned it, and how it has no rifts? And the earth, we spread it out and cast therein firmly set mountains and made grow therein something of every beautiful kind, giving insight and a reminder for every servant who turns to Allah. And we have sent down blessed rain from the sky and made grow thereby gardens and grain from the harvest and lofty palm trees having fruit arranged in layers as provision from the servants, and we have given life thereby to a dead land, thus is the emergence, i.e. resurrection. The people of Noah denied before them. The people of Noah denied before them and the companions of the well, and Thamud, and Ad, and Pharaoh, and the brothers, i.e. people of Lot, and the companions of the thicket and the people of Tuba, all denied in the messengers, so my threat was justly fulfilled. Did we fail in the first creation? But they are in confusion over a new creation. And we have already created man and know what his soul whispers to him, and we are closer to him than his jugular vein. When the two receivers, i.e. recording angels, receive seated on the right and on the left, he, i.e. man, utters no word except that with him is an observer prepared to record, and the intoxication of death will bring the truth, that is what you were trying to avoid, and the horn will be blown, and that is the day of imp uh, implementing the threat, and every soul will come with it a river and a witness. It will be, uh, excuse me, with it a driver and a witness. It will be said, you were certainly in unmindfulness of this, and we have removed from you your cover. So your sight this day is sharp. And his companion, the angel, will say, this record is what is with me prepared. Allah will say, throw into hell every obstinate disbeliever, preventer of good, aggressor, and doubter who made as equal with Allah another deity than throw him into the severe punishment. His devil companion will say, Our Lord, I did not make him transgress, but he himself was an extreme error. Allah will say, Do not dispute before me, while I had already presented to you the threat, i.e. the warning. The word, i.e. decree, will not be changed with me, and never will I be unjust to the servants. On the day we will say to hell, have you been filled? And it will say, are there some more? And paradise will be brought near to the righteous, not far. It will be said, this is what you were promised for every returner to Allah and keeper of his covenant, who feared, for the, uh, who feared the most merciful in the unseen and came with a heart returning in repentance. Enter it in peace. This is the day of eternity. They will have whatever they wish therein, and with us is more. And how many a generation before them did we destroy who were greater than them in striking power and had explored throughout the lands? Is there any place of escape? Indeed, and that is a reminder for whoever has a heart or who listens while he is present in mind. And he, we did not certainly create the heavens and the earth and what is between them in six days, and there touched us no weariness. So be patient, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, over that which they say, and exalt Allah with praise of your Lord before the rising of the sun and before its setting. And in part of the next, exalt him and after prostration, i.e. prayer, and listen on the day when the caller will call out from a place that is near. The day they will hear the blast of the horn in truth, that is the day of emergence from the graves. Indeed, it is who uh, we who give life and cause death, and to us is the destination. 
on the day the earth breaks away from them and they emerge rapidly that is gathering that is a gathering easy for us uh, <clears throat> we are most knowing of what they say and you are not over them a tyrant but remind by the quran whoever fears my threat wonderful next surah surah al dariyat Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. By the winds scattering dust, dispersing it, and the clouds carrying a load of water, and the ships sailing with ease, and the angels apportioning each matter. Indeed, what you are promised is true, and indeed, the recompense is to occur. By the heaven containing pathways, indeed you are in differing speech, deluded away from it, i.e. the Qur'an, is he who is deluded. Destroyed are the misinformers who are within a flood of confusion and heedless. They ask, when is the day of recompense? It is the day they uh, will be tormented over the fire and will be told, taste your torment. This is what that of which you were impatient. Indeed, the righteous will be amongst the, uh, among the gardens and springs, among gardens and springs, accepting what their Lord has given them. Indeed, they were before that doers of good. They used to sleep but a little of the night. And in the hours before dawn, they would ask forgiveness. And from their properties was given the right of the needy petitioner and the deprived. And on the earth are signs for the certain in faith. And in yourselves, then will you not see? And in the heavens is your provision and whatever you are promised. Then by your Lord of the heaven and earth, indeed, it is true. Just as sure as it is that you are speaking, has there reached you the story of the honored guests of Abraham? When they entered upon him and said, we greet you with peace, he answered, and upon you, peace, you are a people unknown. Then he went to his family and came with a fat roasted calf, and he placed it near them. He said, Will you not eat? And he felt from them apprehension. They said, Fear not, and gave him good tidings of a learned boy. And his wife approached with a cry of alarm and struck her face and said, I am a barren old woman. They said, Thus has said your Lord. Indeed, he is the wise, the knowing. Alhamdulillah, guys, uh, this is... Um, the end of the 26th juz. Uh, let me see if there's any um, key points that we can extract from this um, because the um, the surah does go very, very quickly. So let me get us down to the 51st uh, surah the variant. Whoop. Almost there. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I'm going to see if there's anything that catches my eye uh, that's of interest. But so far, it seems uh, naturally it's, it's um, uh, you'll notice that the form, the presentation is very much so rhythmic and, and poetic, right? And uh, obviously, you can't hear the rhythm um in the english but in the arabic which i really encourage you guys to actually take a look at uh, and and listen to the quran as it's intended to be an oratory recitation you'll hear the beauty um let's see up to 19. Mm. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything that is I'm not seeing anything that's sticking out that needs like a, a super deep um, maybe verses 20 to, to 23 and on earth are signs for the certain in faith and in yourselves then will you not see um, and in the heavens is your provision and whatever you're promised. So here's what the tafsir has to say on this briefly. Here Allah says, calling his slave to think and reflect. In the earth are signs for those uh, whose faith is certain. That includes the earth itself, 
and all that is on it of mountains, seas, rivers, trees, and plants that direct the attention of the one who reflects upon them and ponders their significance to the greatness of their creator. The vastness of his power, the comprehensive nature of his generosity, and how his knowledge encompasses all things, both visible and invisible. Likewise, in the individual himself, there are lessons and signs of divine wisdom and mercy which indicate that Allah alone is the one, the unique, the eternal, and that no one creates but he. And in the heavens is your provision, that is the origin of your provision in the form of rain. Whatever decrees come down from heaven, both uh, provision both spiritual and worldly. And all that you are promised of requital in this world and the hereafter, it comes down from Allah like all other decrees. Uh, all earthly provisions stem from the rain, which come from the heavens or the sky. So that was what it was alluding to. Um, having pointed out the signs in such a way that the smart person would pay heed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now swears that his promise and requital are true, and he likens that to the obvious thing to us, which is our speech. Hence Allah says, by the Lord of the heavens and the earth, this is certainly true, as true as the fact of your speaking. So just as you do not have doubt uh, about your speech, you should not have doubt about the resurrection and death. Um, uh, resurrection after death. Uh, let's see if there is anything else. Nope. Uh, that'll that'll take us to the that'll take us beyond the jizz. So inshallah, I'll save the rest for tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, so let me conclude the reading uh, with Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa ashabihi Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali wa ashabihi Ibrahim fil alamin innaka Hamidun Majid. Allahumma barik ala sayyidina wa habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa ashabihi Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali wa ashabihi Ibrahim fil alamin innaka Hamidun Majid.